Welcome, LilyPod listeners and LilyTube viewers uh, to another episode. And we are really excited about these guests that we have today. We've actually been working on lining this one up for some time. Uh, we have Nate and Becky Lambert, who are relatively newlywed. They got uh, married in November of 2022. And um, they have a blended family of themselves and, and eight children between them. Uh, they are very successful real estate investors, and, and now you guys do this together. Is that right? Correct. So, so they both uh, invest in real estate and have before they met, uh, but now they do it together. Uh, before becoming a full-time real estate investor, Nate was a professor of family science at BYU, for five years, uh, Florida State for five years earlier where he received his PhD and, uh, and his master's degree prior to that at Florida State, uh, received his bachelor's degree at BYU. Before um, she and Nate got married, Becky was a team lead and commercial loan officer, loans anywhere between a million and 35 million. So she dealt with some big numbers. Uh, was very been very involved in in real estate for a long time. Um, she did that for twelve years, and before that was a financial analyst. Becky has a master's degree in econometrics from the University of Utah, so she is a self described math nerd. So proudly, uh, <laughs> we're we're happy to have them here. Now, I was a little reluctant to have them on because they seem so unhappy and like they're almost on the verge. A divorce or something. Right? Right? <laughs> yeah, for anyone who's followed them on social media, we know that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're really happy to have them here, and and they seem to have gone about this uh, in the right way, from from what I can tell. Um, it wasn't that long ago uh, that um, we met Nate. We were speaking at a family life conference. I think uh, it was our first time and we've done it like three or four times since, but yeah, it was several years ago and Nate was also a presenter. Right. And we were just bringing out our book, Intentional Courtship. And Nate told us later that he was listening up to, to our uh, stuff a little bit more than he might've let on because it kind of looked like his marriage was headed to a, a rough spot, a rough place. And um, shortly after he and his former wife separated, um, we got together for lunch and had an interesting conversation. Um, but when I think about where he was kind of emotionally then and where he seems to be now, it's like, wow, huge transformation. And it was fairly quick for you. That transformation. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I was, I like to say it, it was, it was like going into a dark, deep chasm. It, it was so painful. I mean, I, I actually had a pretty happy marriage for 18 years. Right. Certain factors happened that just transformed things almost immediately. So I was just shocked and, and felt like the rug was pulled out from under me. The pandemic had a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. And kind of like, this can't be my life. Yeah. I'm like, I never thought this was going to happen to me. You know, like I, I always just thought marriage is for, for eternity. And, and you taught marriage prep at BYU, right? Exactly. I taught all those principles, never get divorced, never get divorced. <laughs> and then here I was like divorced. I'm like, how could this be me? And what are those students going to think of me now? <laughs> yes. Yes. So it was, it was incredibly painful. And, but I just, I got a lot of hope through the gospel, through Christ, through um, the inspirational speaker, Joel Osteen, really filled me with a lot of hope, just helped me realize like, hey, there, things can change suddenly. Things can change unexpectedly. God can craft a turnaround for your life. And certainly my life, actually a year ago tomorrow is when we became a couple. We had dated, we had dated casually for uh, about six months before then. And then with no physical contact at all, really. And then we just uh, became a couple a year ago and 
ever since then. My life has completely transformed. Yeah. And you got married in November of 2022, right? That's Correct. right. And that blended family of eight. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, I, I, you mentioned Joel Osteen and Jeff recently used his ministry to support a tra- an unexpected transition for him. Um, it wasn't obviously a marriage because we've been married five years now, but it was um, you know, more career oriented and um, it was fantastic. And like, it really produced miracles for him too. Like, so for anyone out there who doesn't know who Joel Osteen is, he's a minister. He does lots of like just free motivational material and it's all so uplifting and uh, Bible oriented. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I still listen to him every morning in the bathtub <laughs> i wake up to that <laughs> it's a great way to start the day it just gives right. you hope and faith and trust in the savior trust that he has a plan for you yeah. right and i mean i've tried to do what joel says which is the first time i pray you know for whatever it is i'm i'm needing or wanting and after that i say i i say thanks god that it's on the way you know and uh that's his advice you know that he's lining stuff up for you you may not know it um but i mean i as i look back on my life almost everything that i have experienced that seemed negative that seemed um like a huge setback was actually making room for something better Mm -hmm. and Um, he even asked for doors to be slammed in his face if they weren't the right path so that he could, you know, get to where he wanted to go faster. Right. And I did the same thing with dating back when I just tell me, no, I, you know, as much as it hurts or has, you know, stinky as breaking up is, you know, like I, I just want to be able to get to where I want to go and not uh, end up in another marriage that, that fails. And, and, and not that we get to control that nobody gets to control that, but um, God can help us when we tell him exactly what we're looking for, what we want. Well, you know, I would, I would ask you about this too, because I think, um, one thing I've heard Joel say a lot is if you knew exactly how things were going to turn out, if you knew the end from the beginning, it wouldn't require any faith. And so sometimes you have to take a step or two into the darkness. Now I'm borrowing that, I think from Boyd K. Packer, but anyway, Sometimes you have to take a step or two into the darkness and wait for the light to follow um, because that requires faith. But I think what we can grab a hold of to eliminate a lot of the anxiety um, is the sense that we don't necessarily know exactly the details of what's going to line up. We just know that God loves us and it's going to be great. And I mean, I've, in my last crisis, it literally went down to the last minute (laughs) when I thought, oh, the world's ending now. You know, it was literally where I found out what the answer was going to be. And it, it was, uh, and everything got resolved like in one day after months and months and months of not being resolved. Not knowing not, but the funny thing is during those months and months, we weren't really that nervous. No, We weren't really that worried about it. And that's what that faith brings that hope, you know, is that it'll all work out. Agreed. I would say also one of the benefits of not knowing the end from the beginning is if you knew the end, you wouldn't gain the testimony of the process of Mm -hmm. learning in the, in the process. And if you knew the end from the beginning, so for example, I was in a a marriage for 11 years and it truthfully wasn't very healthy. It was not a very good marriage, but I learned a lot about perseverance and I learned a lot about myself and I became a better person through it. So that when that marriage ended, I was better prepared to be married to Nate. I was a better person than I was beforehand. And if I had known the end from the beginning, I probably would have just jumped out and divorced too early and lost the opportunity for growth that comes in the trials and in the challenges and in when you don't know the next step, the faith that comes with the process. Well, and I believe that your process was a little longer than Nate's. You were a mid-single, single parent for... Uh, about three years is that right but I was technically single for about two and a half years yes okay okay and during 
11 years. <laughs> 11 years. <laughs> well, and during that time that you were officially single, um, kind of what was your process? Like Nate said, he found Joel Osteen and it gave him a lot of hope and he used that to fuel like his direction. What, what did you do? I'm, I'm sure you did something because, you know, you, like you said, you grew a lot through the whole thing. Grew a ton. In all honesty, my experience was drastically different from Nate. Um, my ex-husband, I get along really well now, but our marriage was extremely unhealthy for a lot of reasons. In my situation, divorce was actually a relief. Mm. It was not, I, I grieved the marriage for 11 years. I didn't really have to grieve as much on the divorce as much as. Yeah, you grieved while you were in it. It was a relief, was, yeah. That, yeah. And, and that I experienced after my second marriage. So we're both, um, we both got, had a brief second marriage. And that's relief. And interestingly enough, I, I know what you're talking about, that like once you give up trying to make something work that's not working, peace comes between you. And that's what I experienced too the second time around. So I can relate with that. Um, and then how did you maintain hope that Nate was in your future, even though you didn't know that? Well, in all honesty, the, the divorce was such a relief and such a weight off my shoulders of everything that was going on, that at that point, I could just focus on raising my three kids and doing the best I could. And I, I've i been a runner for oh, probably 24 years. I did a lot of half marathons. I find running to be very therapeutic around mile seven or eight. The stress I have in my heart kind of melts away and I can start to see opportunities and answers and strategize some of the best decisions I've ever made are around mile 12 or 13 or 14 of a long run. Huh. When I realize this is the answer, this is how I solve it. That's not how everybody gets answers. I think I just have to wear myself out enough that I can listen to the Lord. <laughs> it takes huh. a while yeah. to get to that point. <laughs> it's funny, I get my revelation in the car, but for those of you who like to run or walk, like just keep going until you get the answer to what you're saying, right? So, <laughs> yeah, and for the benefit of our audience, Becky today completed what or recently completed her what 32nd half marathon or something like that. The morning of this interview, right? Yeah, the morning of this interview, I finished my 32nd half marathon. Wow. My first one with Nate by my side. And I will tell you, it was a totally different experience. I spent 11 years wishing and hoping that I would cross the finish line of a race and have my husband and my children waiting there to cheer for me. It never happened. Till and today. So until this morning. That's which, awesome. Which is great. I, I want to say this about exercise too, and, and maybe maybe uh, either or both of you can comment on this, but uh, as, as both of you know, and I think a lot of our audience knows, uh, I lost my son, my youngest son, um, to a rock climbing accident in August. Of so, 2022. So yeah. Um, and I remember I was going through some issues with my career at that time as well, that ultimately culminated in the change that Kathy mentioned earlier. But as I was um, uh, starting down that, that journey, I said to Kathy, um, I have experienced what it's like to approach trials with weakness. And I'm going to do it with strength this time. Yeah. And so, and then and he said it the morning that we found out he died. Wow. And so like it's like he had prepared himself to respond with strength to something he didn't even know was coming was something he did know was a, an, an issue. Right. And a big part of that was going to the gym every day, um, whether I wanted to or not. And, and except for a month that I had COVID and on other fairly rare occasions, um, and on Sundays, I didn't go, but other every other day, I pretty much have gone to the gym. And I, I recommend that to our audience um, as an extremely therapeutic thing. It, it punches anxiety in the face better than anything else I know. And really any form of exercise that you like. Right. And so I, I, um, you know, I, I, that is, I think, one, one part of approaching the trials of life with strength rather than weakness because you know if you're going through a really rough thing like a divorce mm -hmm. or death of someone you love the temptation is to lay in bed and feel sorry for yourself and 
you know, no one would blame you for doing that because things like this are so difficult. But I'd like both of you to comment on on that, if you will. Yeah, I'd like to say that I, I noticed this pattern in my life previously. I mean, I had seen my dad pass away. I'd had some big challenges being bullied and being short and so, some big things that happened that prepared me. But I, I had a big career challenge. Yeah. Uh, get into the details, but I had some pretty intense opposition from my boss at the time and it was uh it got so bad that um i just decided i'm done i don't want to be in this kind of environment where i have someone that's coming after me and trying to convince everyone else against me and it was so hard because i'd gotten a phd right I put my heart into this i had been super successful published 70 research articles I mean, it was a lot of people in that position wouldn't want to change at that point. No, exactly. Like the golden handcuffs, you know, it was like, I just, uh, but I just, I was like, I started reading some books on real estate investing and and I just, somehow I just kind of had this, this, this feeling that this was the right direction. It was a complete shift. I mean, there's, I don't I don't know if I've ever met a real estate investor that used to be a professor. <laughs> but uh, but I think because I had seen how the Lord had strengthened me and had given me that, that turnaround in life when when I approached this situation with the pandemic and my wife heading out, my wife at the time heading out. Um uh, leaving me with five kids I mean it was really intense and um but I just I I had seen so many of the same patterns so many of the same things that had happened to me at BYU 10 years previously and so I that gave me a lot of strength I'm like hey the Lord helped me turn things around then he's gonna be there for me now (laughs) and and then I reminded myself every week because I'm 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 LDS and I, I serve in the, in the temple every, every Thursday morning and just being there and just praying to the heavenly father and, and just being around other believers and just being in that atmosphere just gave me so much strength and it renewed my vision of what was possible and helped me to realize, like, like you said, I mean, I think with every challenge that you get through successfully with the Lord's help, you're that much better prepared for the next thing that's coming because you just like like I said I just had so much more faith this time it was excru- it didn't hurt it didn't reduce the pain it was excruciating but I just had this somehow the Lord just gave me this peace that I'm gonna, gonna be okay <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna hook you up with the with the pretty amazing uh blessing do you remember because I wonder if you relate with what I felt which was this seems like it's take well, and and for you it was quicker than for me. But I mean, did did was there a part of you that had to keep reminding yourself of that revelation that you know, like through the you could feel the pain and you'd be like, it'll all work out. Okay, and you feel the pain again, and it'll, it'll all work out. Like you're like in despair, and then it'll all work out. Like you just had to keep telling yourself over and over what you already knew, like deep inside, but you weren't seeing it yet. It did. And that's, that's why for me, Joel Osteen was such a big deal because he was that, he was that person that reminded me, I felt like he was the Lord's spokesperson to me at the time, because it was like every morning I'd listen to him and he'd say exactly that this, you're going to have a turnaround. This isn't a setback. This is a setup. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I remember. I know he said that. But he lot. said that and something came alive in you on the inside. so you met him recently right yeah i just met him a couple weeks ago so how did that happen that's really cool you know i i had a conference out in houston i knew that's where his church was so i'm just like i'm gonna go go there and it turned out that he had like a meet and greet thing right after his sermon so i got to meet him in person and, and and thank him from the bottom of my heart i'm like you don't realize how much you helped me to get to this amazing miracle in my life and just gave me that hope to keep pressing forward and keep my faith and trust in the Lord. That's awesome. And you know, I'm sure he never gets sick of hearing that, like stories like that. 
one thing, well, he tells some of them every time he gets up to talk. But the other thing that I've noticed about him that I really like is he talks about the Bible in a way that that it comes across as these this series of stories about people in these impossible situations. You know, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into a furnace, heated up to six times its uh, normal heat. You know, Daniel being thrown into a den of lions, Jonah being thrown into the middle of the ocean, um, you know, the Israelites being pinned up against the Red Sea with the Egyptian armies advancing on them. You know, go, go down the list. There's all these incredibly, you know, you could read that like a novel and think, well, how in the devil are they ever going to get out of, of this situation, you know? And, but the Bible shows how God, you know, is a God of miracles, how there's nothing too hard for the Lord, you know what I mean? And, and I think that's part of the hope that, that we can have. I mean, Joel Osteen says trouble is sometimes transportation. Mm -hmm. And, and it's been that way with me. I, I remember a situation when in a period of two months, I lost my corporate job. Uh, my second wife and I got divorced. Uh, my son was on drugs and um, my car was in the middle of breaking down. And I had to figure out how to deal with that without a job and without a. And I believe this was New income. Year's Eve. No, no, th that that's that was another... before. Oh, that's yeah, another story. But <laughs> anyway, I'm I'm uh, um, I'm heading out here to Utah, you know, in a car that's barely limping along, and I started all over. And I think you know that could have been a moment. That's trouble leading to transportation for sure. A really incredible, you know, I could have felt really down and at other times in my life I have. I think one difference is my son, Henry, who died uh, recently was with me that, you know, the night I left my second wife and, you know, we went to a movie kind of to take our minds off things. And on the way, on the way uh, back to our hotel, I kind of broke down and I just said, you know, Henry, I don't, I don't know how much more of this I can take. I feel like giving up. And he said, dad, you're the most positive person I know. You can't give up. Aww. And the best thing anyone could have said to me in that moment, yeah. um, he kind of reminded me of who I am. And, and, you know, if I hadn't, if I hadn't, um, had faith in that moment, if I had given up, if, you know, if all of those things that looked like tragedies to me hadn't happened, I wouldn't have Kathy. I wouldn't have my two stepsons. I wouldn't have the career I have now. Well, I, and kind nothing, of like, and we wouldn't have love in later years or our book or anything. Well, and all of those happened incrementally, but sure. in a lot of ways, it seems like when that trouble happens and it kind of happens in spurts almost it seems like things resolve in spurts too and that we can have a turn of like that turnaround that set let's see it's not a not a setback but a setup set up. right so <laughs> it's like the setback that we perceive um leads to a setup that's just as powerful okay. yeah exactly and Becky, I would love to hear. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, Actually, I was going to ask what Becky you? about her turn. And then I'll, I'll turn it to Becky. One other thing that was super helpful was I took some of these these beliefs and and I, I put them into affirmations. I was just going to talk about your affirmations, actually. <laughs> yeah. I can't go see ahead. it, but right behind us, behind the treadmill, he has on the wall all of his goals so that he runs on the treadmill toward his goals and he has a picture and the words below it of his goal so there's a picture of christ and come follow me we're going to study come follow me as a family every week and his goals are financial spiritual emotional physical what's the one i'm missing i swear there's a fifth intellectual intellectual that's what it is <gasps> run towards he your goals on the i love goal that toward his goals. so he he's looking at them every day so they're in the forefront of his mind he has affirmations which i used to do those too and i really love when he's back on the bandwagon of the affirmations yeah. where you just make a list to yourself of things you want to become i am 
a compassionate person. I am a forgiving person or whatever you want to work toward as your, as your affirmations. And it's really powerful because it keeps your goals in the forefront of your mind. It also, he had a lot of affirmations that were very uplifting to remind him that God has a purpose in my life and it's, it's going to be great. We're just not there yet. Things of that nature that help remind you. So it, I think stuff of that nature really helps when you're going through the lulls, the challenges of, I know it's going to be good in the end, but right now I'm struggling. If you're constantly lifting yourself up every morning, instead of waiting until you're filling down, I think it, it definitely helps a lot. I run a lot because it helps with my mental health. It helps me be more compassionate, more, more positive, not overwhelmed. It helps me to deal with the challenges and the hiccups that come with life in general. Because yeah, exercise are- does that for me too. I think it's, I think you'll find it does it for most everyone, if not everyone, it doesn't have everyone to be who really care. does it just something that helps you because it's so important to take care of yourself. That self care is absolutely crucial in order to allow you to become the best person you can be. It's not just about losing weight or anything of that nature. It puts your mind in a healthy mental state so that you can cope with the challenges that are going on. And when your mind is in a healthy mental state, it's easier to feel the promptings from the Holy Ghost. Because if you're just feeling overwhelmed and stressed, there's all that crud that the Holy Ghost has to try to weave through for you to hear it, to hear what he's trying to say. And that I know that kind of stuff helped me a lot through my first marriage and through the divorce, exercising regularly, reading the scriptures every day and listening to um, general conference. I did a lot of general conference that got us through. And I'm going to go on a limb and say, I know most people would totally disagree with me, but I absolutely loved COVID. And here's why. From my perspective, the I filed for divorce and the school shut down in a one week period. All of that happened in one week. So See I went that spurt, being that, married, working full time. Uh-huh. I, I was working full time and married and then all of a sudden in a week, I'm in the middle of filing for divorce and I'm not only working full time from home, but I'm also homeschooling my children now and all of the trauma that comes with that. It was such a powerful experience. It was challenging for the first day or two and it, it was still hard. I mean, I was starting work at like three in the morning so that I could get a bunch of hours in before my kids woke up so that I could focus on helping them and then jump back into work and keep working. But during that time, the kids and I became closer than we've ever been. We were reading the scriptures together every day. We were saying prayers together every day. We were playing card games that involved math, like cover your assets and I make them calculate their stuff on their own. We were memorizing scriptures together. I had them preparing a talk every Sunday because we were doing home church and it's myself and three kids. I'm like, look, I'm not speaking every Sunday. You guys won't listen. So all of them, my oldest at the time was, let's see, how old was Jaden? Eight, nine, somewhere around there. All of them. So they were nine and five and two or nine and six and two. All of them were preparing a talk for our sacred meeting at our house. And little by little, I'd help them practice. I'd help them prepare a talk, help them figure out what to write. And then I taught them the revelation. I want you to pray about it. Figure out what you think the ghost is telling you our family needs. It just opened up windows spiritually for my children that were such game changers. And I think it helped them cope with the divorce and through the challenges of it. We became so close. I just kept telling them, I'm like, look, guys, you're all each other's got for who knows how long until everything opens back up. So I recommend you learn to get along because otherwise card games become really painful. If you're the only one playing solitaire is great, but only for a short period of time and their fighting decreased and their spiritual capacity increased. It was a powerful experience of situations where the Lord can take something negative and make it positive for you. I'm not saying I'm glad people got sick, not at all, but the situation of being forced to homeschool and being with my kids was great. We went exercising every day together as a family and it, it helped us personally a ton. And I can tell you that for me, during the period when I was divorced as a single mom, I always hoped I would meet someone like me but I had told myself it's not worth jumping into a relationship just to be in a relationship. If I find someone really amazing, absolutely. But otherwise I'm fine. I'm happy. I'm happy with who I was happy with who I was. 
I was happy with my career. I was happy with my relationship with my children and my relationship with the Lord. And I think too often people in the singles world think, I'll be happy as soon as I get married. But that's going to make me happy. Guys, if you're not happy with who you are now, you're not going to be happy married. So find your happiness now. Become the person you want to be. Become someone, the kind of person you want to be married to. Because that will attract the right person to you. But also it puts you in the right mental frame to have healthy expectations. If you are unhappy now and you think, oh, if I just find the right husband, I'll be happy. Your marriage is going to end a divorce because you're going to discover that marriage, although it is amazing, has challenges. Yeah. It's complicating to your life. And, you know, when when we uh, wrote Intentional Courtship, there's a chapter where we talk about the thing, you know, paying attention to the things you want in a spouse. And of course, trying to become those things, as you said. But my number one thing on my list, and it's in the book, was I wanted to be with a happy person. And the reason why is, is just the reasons you said Two happy people rarely get together and have a lousy time. But if one or both of them is kind of chronically unhappy, you're going to have an uphill battle the whole way. And, uh, and that wasn't what I wanted. And, you know, my first wife, uh, she and I get along now. We're, we're fine. Kind of like you talked about, but during our marriage, at least she was kind of chronically unhappy. And that was hard for me. I kind of became chronically unhappy too. And so I I think that's an incredible insight uh, for our audience that, first of all, become a happy person. You know, I think that's a that's a big part of your turnaround, whether you're still in a tough marriage and trying to make it work or if you're done. Yeah. And uh, I I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting a companion. In fact, I think that's a normal and natural desire and maybe even wishing for that resolution in your life, um, but then in joy, finding joy in the journey towards that. Like Happiness you said, running towards your goals. It's not about your situation. It's about a mindset. And that doesn't mean if you're a happy person, you never feel moments of sadness. I mean, we, we all feel emotions so are healthy. Those are normal. They're, they help us become who we are. But you have to find your happiness with who you are. It's not that I didn't want to get married. I I really wanted to, but I'd been through 11 years of a very unhealthy marriage. And I recognized <clears throat> that being single was better than being in a bad marriage. Mm-hmm. So that's sure a lot of people have figured that week. out too. Great. But if yeah. not, it's okay. The Lord's yeah. got a plan. It's going to be fine no matter whatever it is. And to be able to plan in either direction so that, you know, you're good either way. Yes. Yeah. So I wanted to touch on a few things you talked about, and I love everything you said. Um, And it really harmonizes with what we've been teaching here on LilyPod and on LilyTube. So one of our YouTube videos is the dating paradox. And the paradox is that when you're desperate for a relationship, when you're unhappy in your singleness, you're not ready for a relationship, which is, you know, kind of, paradoxical because the thing you want the most you're not ready for right and then when like what you said I was happy being single I was happier being single than married I was fine if I never got married and then you found Nate yeah, right if you no longer you're, need a relationship you're, you're ready, ready. For one. yeah <laughs> and that's the paradox not that being married is bad I just some marriages it's better to be single than to be in a marriage that's un <sighs> I don't want to go too into much default, but it, in a marriage that's very um, unhealthy mm-hmm. and derogatory towards your self-esteem and towards you as a person. I don't advocate divorce for people very often, but there are some situations where it really is the best outcome. Well, and God doesn't want any of his children abused, <clears throat> including ourselves. And when you talked about self-care, that's another thing we talk a lot about, Um at the very beginning of lily pot i mean we're into like the 120s 130s in our episodes now but like at the very beginning um we did an episode on um the great the greatest commandment which is to love god to love our ourselves and to love our neighbor like and to and that they all work together in harmony and i when i listen to you talk 
you mentioned, I need, we, we need to be lifted up every day and like intentionally and not just when we feel bad, but just like as a practice. Right. And then you talked about self-care and your running and how that helps you show up better in your, in, in every capacity. And then you talk about how you serve your children. Um, you know, and of course, all of this included you connecting with your maker, with, with God and with, and not just God, but a God who cares for you and who has plans for you that are amazing and awesome and having hope and faith in that. So I guess what I'm saying is I'm seeing like it, the reality of your story play out in that the greatest commandments, which includes those three elements and how they work in harmony together. So, Nate, what's your family science professor's uh, response to the, if you no longer need a relationship, then you're ready for one? Well, there's, there's a, an interesting psychological principle called the principle of least interest. Yes. Yeah. Right? I'm familiar so, with that one. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, Becky, I, I, my top priority, I actually made a list of 53 attributes that I wanted in my future companion. Talk about an overachiever. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I included those in my affirmations and I would, I would yell them out every morning on the treadmill, really, on the treadmill to really <laughs> ingrain them in my head. And the, the very top, most important thing was that she share that she'd be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I just remember actually, it was a year ago that I took Becky on a date before I decided to kiss her and become a couple. And I'm like, I told her about, I had some crazy experiences with some girls who were clearly not, didn't have those gospel standards. They're like, well, what do you think about sexual compatibility? Maybe we should, you know, try it out first. And I'm like, uh, you're not kind of what you're pretending to be here. That's not for me. Right? By the way, so. we have a podcast called sexual compatibility without test driving and it's excellent oh, it's yeah. actually from a therapist and um his i you know I dr john brailsford yeah 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 so the ideas are from him and how psychologically we can explore how we can have good sexual chemistry and compatibility without experiencing it at all like before marriage like i mean obviously you know you had some kissing and stuff but like you know all the rest like is it, it actually is very psychological anyway i mean if you think about it so yes anyway well, that's like, been a, a popular well, podcast because that. that's what people want i think to be able to do is find that chemistry that compatibility but still maintain their standards i think uh uh laura brotherson says that the brain is the big is the biggest sex organ in your body it is. And I want to come back to that in a minute. But <laughs> what I was saying about the about the principle of least interest. I remember Becky, we were, I was taking her on a hike. And <laughs> talking, I told her about some girls that had told, acted like they were one thing. And I found out that they had very different standards than me. And, and, and she's like, yeah, for me, I would rather have someone that shares that standard and or not marry at all. <clears throat> just, I could tell she meant it. Like, I'm like, wow. She would much, it, it, this isn't like a desperation thing. I'm either going to get what I want on this dimension or no dice. And so that, that really made her more appealing. I'm like, wow, this girl's like, this, she's really, it helped me realize this girl is the one because she had that firmness in what was most important to her and she wasn't going to move from it. It's very attractive when someone has their own values and they don't just adopt yours. I Sorry. think I was playing hard to get unintentionally. <sighs> well, I think what you were doing was choosing. Um, and I think if you need a relationship really bad, you can't choose it. It's kind of like, I'm going to choose not to breathe now. You know, how long can you do that? A couple minutes, maybe. Um, if you need it really badly, you can't choose it because there's no choice. If you can do without it, then you can choose the person. And I think it's better to be chosen than to be needed. Okay. What do you guys think? Absolutely. And and I was going to say, touching, going back to what you were talking about, Jeff, about the, the brain being your largest sex organ. I, I yeah. really wanted to make this point because I feel like it might have just been happenstance that worked out like this for us, <laughs> but I feel like this is 
a great principle for, especially for those people who are single listening right now, honestly, the most important advice that I could give you is to not get physically affectionate in the relationship for several months. So, and truthfully, I know this is, this is a high standard, but I, I really think that includes kissing. Um, and here's why your body your body produces <clears throat> dopamine and oxytocin at a very high level. That's why it's the biggest sex organ in your body because of, of these chemicals that it produces and it puts you on this high. And I experienced it myself. Some of the girls I dated first out the gate after getting divorced, you know, I, I, I allowed myself to, to kiss them, make out. And it was like, man, suddenly that dopamine <laughs> like a drug. cocktail it's like you Just, can't think straight after that. Yeah, really can't. it messes with your head and it messes it with your ability to think rationally. On paper, is this person a good fit for me? Do we align on the things that matter? Because you think, oh, we're so in love and that we love each other. And that, that's you like really water. Just- I like water. Whoa, we have so much. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get along so well. <laughs> it, just, it causes you to think they call it love drunk or love stupid for a reason. It causes you to think irrationally about the the true compatibility you have between each other. Yeah. Nate and I dated casually for six months and casually meaning we dated other people, but we went on dates with each other for six months before we actually started kissing. And by the time we started kissing, I already knew not just with my heart and with my head, but just intellectually, this man could potentially be a really good fit for me. We have everything in common that I care about. We share the same goals. We show, share the same values. We share the same parenting models and parenting styles. This could be a good fit. And potentially that made it so letting go of other possibilities was easy oh, because so you knew it would could, could be a real fit, right? Yeah, after those first two experiences, like at, at, once I finally got out and the <clears throat> oxytocin cocktail wore down, I started looking at them. I'm like, what the heck did, was I thinking? <laughs> what did even share in common? Like, in my head, it seemed like a great match. But when I got out of it, I'm like, oh, man. So there were a couple girls, like the, these two I mentioned, that seemed to deceive me in terms of their level of spirituality. I was, <laughs> At that point, I was like, I'm not even getting a kiss girl. I could have made out with both of them. and But I decided very very much in my mind like i am not gonna let myself go down that road route get drunk and high on on this on these substances that the brain produces because i knew it was gonna allow myself to to be deceived right to deceive myself in a way and you learned from experiencing what you didn't want in order to figure that out. And I think a lot of people in their mid singles journeys figure things out by doing things that (laughs) aren't wise, that aren't, yeah, along the way, because we're all just figuring this out, right? And um, I love that you brought this up because it's something I've been pondering a lot lately, that a lot of young people, they get married based on physical attraction like that love drunk stuff. And then they get married and try to figure out if they're compatible. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's what a lot of us do when we're young. And then some of us just get really lucky. And then a lot of us <clears throat> don't, right? Like we find we're not compatible and we end up divorced and- Or in and, a really unhealthy marriage, but still married. Oh, right. I mean, cause that can go on forever. I mean, for like some people just never do get divorced, but they stay yeah. in really just a lot of dysfunction. Right. Um, and then some people choose to divorce the dysfunction and grow as a couple. And I've, I've seen that too. Um, but the, the idea is that we've, I think it's very natural to do it backwards. And if you think about it, the better way it is of course to find out if you're compatible and and then get love drunk with the person you're compatible yeah. with right? right person and that does smooth yeah. out some of the rough edges in the relationship yeah. it um, does because otherwise you get past that and then and you're married and you're like oh crap we don't really have anything in common and and what's left you know for me i was like i had a lot of very specific things in mind i wanted someone <laughs> shared my desire for exploring for traveling for 
hiking and biking and things like that because I wanted to have something to share with her, right? I'm so glad you brought that up because at, Nate, you have so much energy. You needed yeah, someone with a lot of energy to match you. <laughs> Which he got. <laughs> he got someone who run, has run 32 half marathons. Our <laughs> travel style would be exhausting for most people, it would but be. we love it. We love it. It fits us. And not that you have to be compatible in your like travel style per se, but it was great that we got that. One thing I wanted to say is I am very, very proud to say that in the almost three years that I was divorced, I went on a ton of dates. I never kissed anyone except Nate. Wow. Because I'd already been through 11 years of a very unhealthy marriage, much the same way. Like I thought we had a lot in common. And soon after getting married, we realized we have almost nothing in common. And we tried to find things we had in common, but it just, it wasn't much. There wasn't much to work on. And I was alone for the vast majority of our whole marriage. I did almost everything alone. Um, including going on vacation with the kids alone. He didn't want to go. And so because I had been so alone, that's why I was talking about like in my situation, getting divorced was actually better than being married. And, and that's not always the case, but because I had had those experiences, I had set the standard early on. I'm like, look, I'm not going to kiss this guy until I have had time to really get to know them. And I'm confident this is someone I'm really interested in because I don't want to end up in the same situation again. Yeah. And, and you have a right to be really proud of that. And that's a good decision that you made for yourself. And um, I think it's that discipline of running, spilling over into other areas, being more disciplined in, you know, that process of finding your person. Quite frankly, <laughs> if they had tried to kiss me on the first or even the second date, there wouldn't have been a second or a third. Yeah. I already knew that if anyone tries to kiss me too early on, that tells me they haven't even invested the time to get to know me. <clears throat> People who are like, I love you. I'm like, you don't even know me. You haven't invested the time to know me. Mm -hmm. so don't start with this. I know I love you and I want to kiss you. Like you're just letting the hormones <laughs> kick in. And anyone who lets their hormones control them instead of their brain, I don't want to be with them. Those are people who have high probability of infidelity later on because their hormones run their life, not their brain. You know, it's so funny. I was just thinking about that egg cracking commercial. Like this is your like brain on drugs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> just say oh, no, dear. just say no to mindless kissing and get to know a person. <laughs> like really get to know a person. No. I know I'll tell you guys, a done, guys, I get it, but it's worth it. It's yeah. worth it. Yeah. And the challenge I think for a lot of our, a lot of your listeners is that when you're divorced, <clears throat> you're in so much pain, you're feeling lonely there's just so many reasons where why you want that, yeah, value. that dope but we don't blame anyone for doing that <laughs> we get it but get it's it. it so it's so natural to do it but it's so important to resist and like for me you know one thing i wanted to say is like we, we dated we had, we had some dates with our kids like at the children's museum and we talked about our parenting styles and like i was one of the things i really wanted was an authoritative parent and some of the things that Becky showed, she even gave me like some journals for my kids to fill out. And she told me all about what she did during the pandemic. I'm like, oh, your kids are giving church talks and at home. And every Sunday. They get every Sunday. Every I'm Sunday. like, man, this girl is so authoritative. How does she get her kids to do all these chores and all these things? So I, I got to see that she had, she was the kind of mom that I really wanted for my five boys desperately and she's turned out to do far more than I ever could have <laughs> dreamed or hoped of for my kids right but I wouldn't have known that had I just jumped in fast and not really gotten a chance to not only get to know her but to see her in, 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 as a parent as well I I you know I was just going to tell you guys this sort of funny thing about the brain on drugs thing Kathy and I were doing another broadcast and I don't even remember which one it was but um, she talked about how, you know, late in her dating journey, she was dating two different guys and trying to choose between them. And then I came back into the picture because we had dated for a while and broken up before. And she says toward the end, and I just figured out ultimately that Jeff made the most sense. And I said, wow, isn't that romantic? Can you imagine stand, <laughs> sitting on the back of a cruise ship looking out at the ocean with a full moon up and say, you just make so much sense. So sometimes <laughs> in romantic mo uh, moments, I actually say that to him. <laughs> <laughs> so, however, it, 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 I'm, I'm more um, romantic about that thought now than I might have been 
you know, as a younger man, because I, I believe that love, the emotions of love are the fruit, not the root, that the root is agency and that you choose it. And if you choose it um, strongly enough and emphatically enough and stick to your choice, ultimately, you know, you're going to have the fruit that's going to be there. But if you choose, if you say, you know, not that that love uh, depends on commitment, but commitment depends on love, then it's like Becky said, the hormones are going to run everything. Well, maybe I don't love that person. I thought I did, but... Well, and then how can anyone ever trust that in a marriage like that's supposed to be forever when we're not choosing, we're just like deciding if we're in love or not. Like, like oh, not deciding, but um, we're just observing. Like it's beyond us and we're not choosing. Yeah, there's a there's a phrase that we I would teach as a family scientist is called sliding versus deciding. Mm. So most people just slide into a relationship out of convenience, out of chemistry. Wow, she's so hot. I'm just gonna, you know, rather than deciding, hey, here's what's important to me, here's what I want, here's my standards, and then actively checking to see without the dopamine cocktail if that person has those attributes. Once you've really tested out for a while, boy, we're celebrating a year tomorrow of that. The sparks really started flying, you know, <laughs> but, uh, and we had to get married like five months later. Cause you know, we're like, this is it, you know, but well, I knew at that point, I'm like, this is, this is who I want to be with. But that That's was so awesome. important to, to decide rather than slide into the relationship. Yeah, I, I totally agree. So how did the two of you meet anyway? to say or you say it? oh you go ahead okay um so a friend of mine who is also single reached out to me and said hey i really want to go to this party but i don't want to go alone in case you know there's just crazy guys there do you want to come with me i said okay it was a party for the single lds entrepreneurs group oh yeah turned out it was here in nate's backyard because he founded the organization <laughs> talk about <laughs> deciding versus sliding i literally was like you know, I mean, depending on your profession, there's there's not a right or wrong thing, but I'm an entrepreneur at heart and I feel a lot more connected to other entrepreneurs. It's almost like a, it's like a culture. It's like a huge thing. So I'm like, okay, I really want someone who's an entrepreneur. I mean, real estate investor would be the top, which I ended up getting, That's me. <laughs> but uh, I wanted that entrepreneur and I wanted obviously for them to be LDS because the, the spirituality was a big part and they kind of needed to be single too. Right. So I'm like, I'm going to create this single LDS entrepreneur group. And, and uh, I, I blew it up to, we had like 40 people on the board. I had like 120 people show up at my house for this party. We had like Hawaiian hula dancers come. I mean, oh, it was, they, were, <laughs> yes, they were fire dancers. Fire dancers, guys. that's fire, right. Fire dancers. <laughs> <laughs> when I do anything, I do it with the, with the bang. What can I say? <laughs> but I, I'm like, this is what I want and I'm going to go after it. And, you know, we met the, that first night where I had 80 other women, you know, in line to chat, chat with me. And The party had like 120 <laughs> people and they were the vast majority of them were women who were trying to hook up with him i'm gonna be the first to admit i created my own dating pool right i mean <laughs> well, and, that's and, very was that intentional. your intention from like it was starting it or did you also just want to connect with like-minded people too no it was purely about finding a, a woman okay well i have to say it's not only brilliant but for our listeners i love the idea of creating your own opportunity and that with some inspiration and very intentional mindset of what you're looking for. Like you said, you paired up LDS, entrepreneur, created your own dating pool by starting a group. I mean, that's ingenious. Now, friends, this and is also, also showing you that Nate was fishing with a net and not a fishing pole. That's right. <laughs> that's right. And, and I was, you know, the other group I went to that was already created was the Wasatch Wednesday hiking group because I love hiking and exploring. I'm like, where better to find people that like that stuff than better hiking with me, right? Because a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, I love to travel. I love, but in reality, they don't, you know? <laughs> I love the idea of travel. Yeah, a lot of people love the idea of travel. So I took Becky on a short vacation. We were very careful, right? 
But uh, we, we, we went out. separate hotel rooms. Yeah, we went to Mexico and Costa Rica together because I wanted to see what her travel style was like. It wasn't she that acted... short. It was 12 days, guys. Okay, 12 we went days. to Africa. That's right. You guys went to Africa, you yeah. know? So it's like, <laughs> you got to really see. I mean, these were the things that I wanted, so I really wanted to test it out and and make sure that I was getting exactly what I wanted and and it's it turned out so great because we line up like perfectly in like every way like that's why we're so happy together because we're we're almost like one person in a way yeah, yeah you guys do seem very joyful about your relationship yes and that's you make sense encouraging we make see. sense I love it yes <laughs> uh someone complimented us recently when we were speaking in a military event um in front of how many people do you think that were like 700 ton of people they came up to me, they're like wow you're like me in the female form <laughs> <laughs> kind of true <laughs> but i think the research shows by the way that the more similarities you have the better off your relationship's going to be i had becky take a personality test um this was the before big five we were personality test this was like after like our third date which you would think seems really weird, but actually what I loved about it is that I could see his results after I took it on my own and he'd already taken it before me. So I knew he wasn't making this up to try to become what I was looking for. Cause I met a lot of guys who were like, oh yeah, I'm a real estate investor too. You'll love it. It turns out like they own a condo that they live in. I'm like, that's yeah. not a real estate investor. <laughs> I mean, it's not money. It's about yeah, personal. We call that dating chameleons. You you're not. Yeah. Yeah. So dating chameleons is something we've we've talked about before, and you're not what you're saying is that there's a lot of them out there. Exactly. Yeah. That's why you got to be intentional, even about things like personality are such a big deal. I mean, I would recommend to anyone that's listening have your if you're getting serious with someone or or even like the idea of someone, have them take some of these personality tests, see how you match up, because the more similarities you have, the better. It, it's going to make life so much easier. We, we interviewed Dr. Greg Bear on this program at one point, and he, we talked about that idea that, you know, people will try to become what they think the person they like wants um, in order to have that person. And I think that's one of the dangers of I need a relationship, um, you know, that, that, that mentality. Yeah. They can kind of become a chameleon. And he said, yeah, the, the worst thing that can happen to you in that situation is that you succeed. <laughs> because then you have to continue being what you're not. Or sorely the... disappoint that person <laughs> once you, you know, they find out that's not really you. Right. But exactly. I like that you also went into, I took advantage of resources that were already there. <laughs> to find compatibility with people who actually are doing the things, not just saying they're doing the things. Was it that BYU relate test, by the way? No, it was the big five personality test. And what okay. I loved about that Jordan is- Jordan Peterson. Like, it's version. a big one. Oh. I'm not familiar with that one. And I'm Jordan familiar Peterson with a lot of them. an online version that's so good. I forgot he was a psychologist, <laughs> but that's true. Drinking in- in a lot of things, a lot of different aspects of personality. And I also love that, so Nate took it first and then I take it, took it later and I couldn't see his results till I was done. It goes through and it tells you, these are the aspects in which you're really compatible. These are the ones in which you're different. Here's the situation, here's the aspects of a relationship between the two of you that would be really strong and really great. Here's the aspects that you need to watch out for because there's a potential problem here. It's detailed. I mean, how many pages yeah, do you think that report was? It was, it's long. Can you tell me, so it's called the big five? The big five personality um, by, if you, if you type in big <laughs> personality, um, comma, Jordan Peterson, it should pop up on Google. Is Peterson E-N or O-N? E-N, I believe. I, yeah, he's pretty famous. I think so. I, I don't remember. Well, if I have any trouble finding the link, I will reach out to you because I'd like to provide that in the show notes just so that if anybody wants to Absolutely. take you up on that idea... I mean, it's like it. 25 bucks, but that was like, that was like the best, best 25, 25 bucks, bucks I ever, ever. spent <laughs> because, well, because I saw that was actually how I fell in because I was kind of tied up with this other girl and I was, but I was like, really? Like I'm seeing, she's got like all these things. She's got everything I want. When I had her take that big five personality test, we've lined up like our personalities are like eerily really similar. similar. You're really similar. similar. I'm like, wow. I'm so like, one day somebody's gonna say to Nate, "You're like the male version of Becky." <laughs> That's, <laughs> right. That's right. 
You know, it's it's funny, but I, I want to make this point because it's so it fits so well here. Like Nate talked about admitted, I suppose is the word. Oh, I totally started that group to find somebody to date. And and I want to make this point to our listeners that I think our culture, our media culture is that you fall in love, that it's something that just sort of arbitrarily happens to you. And like all the fairy you know, tales comes, like that. A, comes upon you unbidden, you know, yeah. you meet at a train station in Europe and your eyes lock and all of a sudden, you know, love within five and, minutes. Huh. and uh, what, what Nate and Becky are describing here is very much the opposite of that idea. It's like, okay, what kind of person would I like to be with? A Latter-day Saint entrepreneur. I'm going to start a group of those. And, uh, and <laughs> line them up to talk to me. He finds the one he likes the best and makes her take a personality test. <laughs> and, yeah. and, I like and, that right there. Finds the one he likes the best, makes her take a personality <laughs> test. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I mean, it, it, it could almost sound a little bit ridiculous, but but here's the point: we we named our book "Intentional Courtship" for a reason. Yeah. Um, it is about intentionality. It's about figuring out what you really want, what will make you happy, what what kind of person you would be best for, and going out and finding that. It's not a you know you create the magic. It doesn't just sort of fall upon you unbidden. Yeah, and let me just you guys make have a thoughts point on, on that. Let me make a point on that. Like, I would never advocate for divorce, but I'm pretty much divorced, so I can say this more freely. This is, in some ways, a gift. Like, I don't know how people in their twenties make oh. it. Work. I think a lot of it's luck. Yes, some are just staying in a very unhappy marriage because of the culture. But here's the thing: like, I, I really like didn't even know just how much I like love to travel and explore. I didn't even. I wasn't even into hiking in my 20s I didn't know that I was an entrepreneur like so many of these really core part pieces of who I am today I didn't fully discover until my mid to late 30s you so, wouldn't have wanted the same things back then oh no, no. exactly like like you know my former spouse we still get along great but boy we don't really share that much in common it was mostly just the gospel connection back then because that right. was the main thing that I knew was important to me but since then, I've discovered a lot about who I am, what's most important, what are my biggest passions. And so the, the beautiful thing about getting divorced in later life is you have a, a, chance, a second lease on life. You have a chance for a do-over, not only a do-over, but a, a do-over in the most amazing way possible where you can, you can do the research and do the self-searching and create the opportunities to meet the kind of person that really maps on to your greatest passions because when you find someone that shares your greatest passions in life it is like magic so <laughs> this is such a, a a breath of fresh air in some ways it felt terrible but in, in hindsight i'm like wow how great a chance to to meet someone when i'm mature when i know who i am when I know what I really want out of the second half of my life. Absolutely. It looked like a setback and really it was a setup. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, I feel that way too. I mean, I, I've said to Kathy sometimes half kidding, you know, man, I wish we could have met when you were 18 and I was 30. You That's know? exactly what I was going <laughs> to mention. <laughs> and, uh, and she says, I, you wouldn't have liked me when I was 18. And and um, uh, no, I think I said we wouldn't have liked each other. Something like that. Yeah. We wouldn't have been wanting what we want now. Like you said, that wanting what you want changes over time. And that do over happens with a very fresh perspective on who you are, who you are and who you're becoming. And that like what you said about running towards. Well, I think Becky mentioned that you ran towards your goals and who you were becoming <clears throat> and that. Yeah. Right yeah those goals back there so for anybody you know and listening they they just panned up to where you run towards every day like you've got this vision yeah, board do you see yeah. all those pictures that are hung up there's words yes. underneath that just has them hanging on the wall with each of his goals oh that yeah, yeah that's, that's awesome. great yeah so uh, yeah I love that idea of not only running towards your goals but who you want to be 
And then, and in that becoming, then you partner with someone who supports who you're becoming, supports where you're headed and you're going in the same direction. That was a big part of my list. My list, I had narrowed down to four things that I wanted to create with someone. And then there was some, some subcategories. So like that I could make sense of the, you know, 50 or 60 things like what Nate had and put it into one succinct, like, okay, this is basically what I'm looking for. And I'm going to open up to the idea that it could look different than all my like little things within those things, if that makes sense. <laughs> because I think when we open ourselves up to the possibility that it could look different, but still be within the realm of what we want. Like we get all these bonus qualities in a partner that we're just like, wow, this is so cool. This is a real person here. Kathy makes really good sweet potato soup. <laughs> but that's only because we went on a um, journey about what seven or eight months ago to mm -hmm. your son's funeral that's true and where we stayed like we got there at 2 a.m and they had a crock pot of sweet potato soup on and she gave me the recipe and it, we find it very comforting mm -hmm. so it, that's like that becoming like you become as a couple with your experiences so I, I want to go back to magic for a second, because I, I might have sounded like I was poo-pooing that. And yet all of the stuff that we talked about early about how God's planning your turnaround and all that, that's more on the, the mystical, magical side. Um, but then there's all this intentional and, effort and actual um, action taking place in your life to make that possible, to help let God work through you as you move forward. Yeah. Right. The places where I would meet single people. Yeah, I was engaging in <clears throat> creating groups. It's not that we were sitting back in our basement saying, God, bring someone God, to my basement. Yeah, God, make it happen. I'll <laughs> do it. I think most of us would love if someone would just show up at our door and we don't have to do anything. Actually, I, I would hate glad, it. Yeah, I'm glad it didn't happen because I appreciate Becky so much more. So I had to work <laughs> my butt off and get really creative. To be able to make all the things that the Lord promised me come to pass. That's a really good point. So it's something we might wish for, like, you know, kind of kiddingly, yeah. but it's not what we really want. What we really want is the journey, the process. Well, think so. about it. Most people who win the lottery end up bankrupt within about five years. Mm -hmm. You have yeah. to earn it in order to appreciate it. And once you've earned it, you're more, you're a more wise steward with what you have. If Nate had showed up at my door when I was 18 and he was, how old were you, been 20, 21, something like that, I don't think we would have liked each other just because we hadn't found ourselves, but also because we hadn't put forth the work necessary to appreciate each other and to see just how much we had in common. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Becky, I think that's a really good point. And I want to suggest this other idea that, that is very closely tied to that. Um, and I'll say it this way, like I, I spent about four and a half years completely broke uh, and it coincided with my divorce for good reasons. But in any event, I was completely broke. I thought, yeah, I'd like to meet somebody, but I can't really, I don't really feel good about going out and dating anyone seriously when I'm, you know, I, I would essentially have to be couch surfing and <laughs> whatever. And and uh, I got a career opportunity out in Texas. It wasn't my dream job by any means. It wasn't, you know, anything I would have sought out, but it came to me. And, you know, it felt really good after I made that move. Just simple things that I had never really thought about before when I was, you know, living in my house that looked out over the ocean and stuff. I just having a car that I liked, that was fun to drive and reliable, uh, having that career opportunity made that possible. Um, having a little money in my pocket to take a lady out to dinner, you know, something I really valued, even though before I had sort of just taken things like that for granted. And I kind of rediscovered my life, everything about it, the things that made me tick, the things I enjoyed, the things I appreciated about life. And suddenly they were all so much more delicious to me because 
um, I had known what it was like to lose them, to, to lose everything really, you know, and, and I think maybe part of God gave Job twice as much as he had before. I think he probably did give him literally twice as much as he had before, but he also appreciated it twice as much. And yes. I think you, yeah. you can only enjoy something or get pleasure or joy from it to the, to the extent that you appreciate it. And, you know, so I've since my life has gotten even better as I met Kathy and as I got into a career that was more aligned with my values and, and, uh, and skills and all of that, you know, I've got a nicer car now, but the point is really not about the circumstances I'm in. The, it, it is about, I think having lost both lost a marriage and, and uh, lost all my money a couple of times that um, everything I have now, I don't take it for granted the way I used to. Could you? And that's what happy people do too, together is that like, wow, this is so awesome. How great is our life? I say that Amen. every day with me. And I yeah. think because of my experiences, it makes me appreciate Nate so much more deeply. Every time he you know, helps put the kids to bed. Every time he is on client calls, cleaning the kitchen, I'm like, oh my goodness, what kind of an amazing man am I married to? Because I appreciate it so much. I appreciate all the things he does to try to help me. I appreciate all the ways that he shows me he loves me. I appreciate all the things that he does that are just kind gestures. Because when you haven't had that, it's so much more meaningful. And I think that's really what makes our marriage so strong, along with the gospel, is the fact that appreciate all the little things that each other do because it's hard to be happy in a marriage when you just feel unvalued when you feel like my spouse doesn't care about anything i'm trying to do to help out i'm trying to show love and they don't even notice it yeah That's the best way to make your marriage just kind of downhill 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 because you feel unappreciated and unvalued it makes you not want to help out and it turns out i've discovered the more often i tell nate how much i appreciate him, the more he does <laughs> <laughs> it's that law of attraction what you put your focus yes. on you get more of and when you focus on what you really appreciate it just naturally flows more of it to you I mean really in relationships that's how it works right when we feel appreciated heck yeah I want to show up and be your you know your hero yeah well I mean and I, I don't what did you say I say a, a, a virtuous spiral upward. an upward spiral yeah right I mean and, and I don't know why this example comes to mind for any of our audience that's sensitive to this, forgive me, but imagine there's a guy and he's always complaining that his wife doesn't have enough sex with him or that she just sort of is a dead fish or whatever. And he's always making those, those kinds How of comments. How much of a turn on is that for you women? Versus the guy that says, man, you're so beautiful and amazing. And I had so much fun with you this last time and whatever who's going to have more sex in the future you know and yet what do people do they try to punish it out of each other and it's not just sex i mean th there's actual studies that show that men who do dishes have more sex but this isn't just about sex <laughs> it's, it, it's about anything i mean the more he feels appreciated for doing the dishes the more dishes he's going to do and go, you know, go down the list of things that are part of a life together. So I'd like to share um, something here. I was listening to a podcast yesterday by Jennifer Finlayson Fife. Um, we actually actually subscribe to her room for two podcasts where she does couples coaching, um, which is actually really insightful. And I've, I've learned a lot from that. And she talked yesterday about how women are turned on by being desirable to their spouse and men are turned on by being effective in their like the role as a husband and father and that that's what we find to be um that's what we find to be really helpful in the bedroom like so anyway and so uh, yeah I, I see becky said absolutely i don't think anyone <laughs> heard, but so you agree with that oh so did you mute it i think you muted it just <laughs> Oh, no. I oh, it's not, okay. oh, you're, you're, you're still on. Okay. And um, I know so, we need to wrap up here pretty quick. Yeah, and we will be wrapping um, up. I just, um, I wanted to get your um, feedback on that real quick, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. 
Well, it is true. The thing is, I assume this is probably true with a lot of women, but absolutely with me. Like I told Nate, my intimacy desire is very much connected with my mind and my heart. When I feel valued, when I feel appreciated for who I am, absolutely, absolutely. But if you're isolated all the time and you don't really want to spend, take the time to spend time with your spouse and show them you appreciate them, a man who comes up to his wife who he's ignored all day long is like, hey, I want sex. Well, what kind of answer do you think you're going to get? Like, I'm, that's not my job. I'm not here just to please you when you want and then see you, you know, whenever you come around to me again later on. My job is to be your spouse. And when you're connected emotionally to each other and you really are happy, like working together, appreciating each other, mm-hmm. it works wonders. You value being known and seen exactly. and that when you're known and seen and you're connected um in that way then everything is in between is foreplay everything all your whole relationship yeah exactly. Great point. Okay. and then so you have blended a family of eight children you said it's going splendidly that's a lot of kids to keep track of but i yeah, know you blended got the, four you, i know you've got the resources and the wisdom and the skills to do it Um, Is there anything like you'd just like to end with in terms of just really anything, but even also just moving into remarriage and blending families, what you've learned? Anything you wanted to talk about that hasn't come up yet or anything like that? There's some books we read together as a couple before Mm. we were married, and we have continued to read through our marriage that have helped a ton. Yeah, Blended. Blended was a really good one. Um, There's one on the five love language Five Love Languages of a Blended Family, I think is what it's called. Mm. Um, we, you can, we should put those in the show notes. By Ch- John Chapman. Yep, yes. That. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, let's see what other ones we do. I know we just listened to one that was really good. It was called Untangled. And that's not about blended. It's about understanding teenagers. It says on the title, it's about teenage girls. But the reality is it's very, very applicable to boys. And so kind of understanding the stages of where your kids are will help you know how to connect with them and how to bring them on board on the blending and then just the patients. Everyone yeah. blends differently. One of the best analogies we've heard is that a uh, second marriage is a lot like a crock pot. You put all the ingredients in, you turn them on and some of them cook really fast. And some of them are more like that pot roast. It just needs all day. It takes a long time. Yeah. But when it's blended, the flavors are powerful. And the stew takes a while to cook, but then when it's ready, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yep, that's what we always say. I'll just say one final thing on this note is the putting the marriage first is so important. It's I'm just like, Hey, I am loyal to you above everything else. I'm committed to you. And having that relationship time is so powerful. It, it actually keeps the crock pot warm by, by the marital intimacy and, and connection that we have and the, the, and the, loyalty that we have to each other i always have her back on everything and that's made such a difference in being able to make a massive turnaround in our family so so marriage prep the advice is practice appreciation right appreciation and gratitude because then you can move into a marriage and keep expressing that and have it be really great exactly but with blending what i really love is the whole concept of we have each other's back because children they're going to try to pit you against each other (laughs) and they do it when it's your first marriage but they do it 10 times more when it's a second marriage because it it almost feels like mom i'm losing my parent because my parent is now remarried this other person they almost feel like they have to pull you back away so they can have you to themselves so be prepared for that and know what's going to come and even if your spouse does something you don't disagree with you present a unified front and then you talk about it alone later on. The kids need to see that your marriage is strong because otherwise they're not going to invest the time and the effort necessary to connect with that other spouse. It's like, eh, this one may not last anyway. Or if they, if they are going to, it's going to be because you do, right? It's because you are unified that they're like, oh yeah, I guess I better get to know this person. When they see that this marriage is going to last, like we are so happy together. There's more of a desire to, connect and make it work and figure it out i mean we we had that one makes that, sense we had one that kind of resisted accepting me for a while and he was you know polite and everything but, but now he openly says i love you jeff yeah he, five years in he's like yeah he's like very loyal to me now and yeah and i think that take that stew took a while to cook 
He was the carrots. But because like, I feel like the carrots yeah. are the one that takes forever. Yeah. <laughs> and that trust well, in fact, I was talking to Nate one night about something unrelated to all this. You probably remember this. And you and Becky were engaged, I think. And that kid that we were talking about mm. came up and gave me a, a hug and a kiss and said good night and said he loved me and walked downstairs. And I remember Nate saying, wow, that just gave me a lot of hope. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure you get that now too, Nate. Or is that yeah. is that still melding? It's still it's come a long way. It's a come long a really way. long way. Yeah. Well, you're only you know seven, eight months in, something I'm like that. Seven months in. Yeah. But last yeah. night, my our youngest daughter, the one that came from my from me before the marriage, introduced herself to my friends as Nate's daughter. I was like, that was awesome. Oh, oh, I love it when we love that when we hear that too. That's really sweet. And you know, I would love sometime, maybe a, a year from now to have you guys back on if you're willing to talk more about the blending of yes. your family. Now, once you have more experience, because I think you'd have a lot of wealth to share. I mean, I'm sure you already do, but you'll have even more, you know, in a while from now. So yeah. Would love to. It's been so amazing chatting with you guys. This has been a blast to think back on all these important principles. And and uh, we sure love you guys and think so highly of you. You've thank been- you so thank much. Thank you. And we we think highly of you as well and are, are so grateful that you were willing to come on and share your wisdom and experience with uh, with our guests or with our audience. So And um, with that, we'll say. Remember, anytime is a great time for a more love in your life. Thank you for watching and listening.